Good afternoon and welcome to the evolution of the clinician's role within a revenue cycle EHR implementation, a webinar tweet chat combo from healthsystemcio.com. Just some housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of HealthSystemCIO.com, and I will be your moderator today. We are having a simultaneous tweet chat hosted by Kate Gamble, our Managing Editor and Director of Social Media. Um, you can participate in a separate browser or on your phone by using the hashtag HSCIOChat, or if you just want to view the tweet chat, you can look in the Media Viewer panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll also be using the Q&A panel today, so when you do think of a question, type it in at any time in the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and send it in. Leave the default set to all panelists. We'll pose them later in the program. And you could download the deck using the URL on your screen. It's also at the bottom of some of our slides and will be sent out in the chat box. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, we're going to go about 40 to 45 minutes. First, we're going to hear from our featured speaker, Chad Brizendine, VP and CIO at St. Luke's University Health Network. And then we're going to have our Q&A with Chad. So without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to our good friend, Chad Brizendine. Chad, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Anthony. Really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to try to turn the dry, dry subject into something fun, and I think um, as CIOs, um, Money super important, obviously, to us in the business, and especially with our, our uh, friends and colleagues, the CFO, uh, when we focus on it. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the clinician's role and really how we uh, went about our um, EPIC EHR uh, revenue cycle implementation and really the, the dynamics of that uh, project. So just a couple of things on the agenda. Um, the, I'm going to talk a little bit about the goals and the outcomes, uh, some of our change management strategies, really how things worked after go live, uh, and then some of the lesson learned and optimization things that we did. So really want to talk about some of our risks, how we kind of did a big bang, um, really where we shifted the roles and responsibilities, how we got the frontline clinical departments involved and, and how that transition occurred really talk about our, our post-go-live and really what we did to incorporate those uh, changes to make them successful post-live, uh, and then highlight some of the tools and methods we use to really uh, work through those projects and um, really get to a, a very good uh, success story. So just background on St. Luke's, uh, we're located in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. We're a little over 270 locations. Uh, about $1.7 billion in annual revenue. We, we transitioned uh, January of 2016 uh, over Big Bang from McKesson, uh, Star, which is in many of our facilities, to Siemens, um, and, you know, had a really good success story with that. Um, and we have, you know, many, many EMRs and obviously very complex, like I'm sure many folks have gone through. So our plan, like I said, um, was go live, big bang. Uh, we invested right under $100 million in capital. Uh, we were about 7% under our, our capital budget. Um, really good, strong scope management uh, within that project to make sure that it came under budget. Uh, and really we knew early on, and, and I want to thank many of the folks that I was able to talk to as we were preparing for ours. I, I spent plenty of time with CIOs gathering knowledge uh, consultants across the industry, and really a lot of things that came through were, you know, we really need to have our operations engaged, we really need to have good scope management, and we need to have good risk management. So some really uh, obviously key uh, components to our plan was to figure that out. Um, and we really built our own plans around all these things and made it a key part of the project every day, every week, uh, and we, we focused on it. Now talk a little bit about how we did that. So um, we basically determined that one of the major, you know, we kept hearing, you know, out in the rumor mill that um, Epic Revenue Cycle was a challenge. You know, we saw many folks that had lost money, had um, kind of stumbled out of the gate. Uh, and I spent plenty of time, went on many site visits, tried to understand what this issue was. And, and really what it came down to was the change management exercise and understand current state roles and responsibilities. Uh, and one of the themes we kept picking up on was we probably really need to have someone outside of the project 
supporting us from, an, from a change management perspective, helping our operations really understand where those roles were going to change, what tools and methods those folks were going to need to be, and where the accountability was going to lie after the project. It was no longer going to be on the revenue side, and it was going to transition to the frontline support staff. So we were able to think through those changes, really move the ownership of the charge and testing out. Uh, and when we, were, when we went live, our goal was to have, like, really be in the top decile of all the EPIC metrics from all the EPIC implementations, and, and we did that. Uh, and it really is a testament to our operations folks really understanding the importance of this, what it actually meant in dollars and cents to the organization if we were at baseline or better than baseline, and, and the results have been substantial because of that energy that was placed in. So as I mentioned, you know, we, we were shooting basically for the best, um, hoping to get somewhere between um, great and excellent. Um, we were able to accomplish that, and, and that's a lot of energy, and we, so we basically came up with some key metrics. A lot of them were, were related to gross pre-baseline capture to forward baseline, and these are standard metrics that Epic's, Epic captures, and they report on them across all their folks. And really to make that transparent around folks, so that folks on the business side, on the clinical side specifically, the really a lot of them didn't manage the revenue, or where they did, there was definitely some broken processes in there, and they really didn't understand the entire revenue cycle process and what their role was in that. So we first engaged them. We had many workshops um, that we created throughout the project to help them understand, like, what was revenue capture, what was really done, and that was co-owned between our consultants and our revenue cycle team to really engage those managers early. Also, we came up with a standard reconciliation proce process and really implemented a consistent reporting package, even pre-live, so that people would know pre-live and post-live how to translate the information. So some of our cumul cumulative revenue capture, um, we basically did task force meetings. Um, as I said earlier, we had seven hospitals, so we have seven hospital presidents, and we have you know hundreds of managers throughout the throughout the network. Each of those managers, are, uh, clinical managers, are now responsible for their own revenue. Um, we were able to break even back to our revenue within uh, eight days, uh, which we know is in the top probably five to six Epic implementations as far as break even on cumulative baseline metrics. And what that was able to do was actually get above our goal. We hit 103.2% of our baseline. And basically what that resulted out in being, because uh, now, you know, when you fast forward three or four months, what we've been able to do, you know, post-live and sustain was about 109% of our baseline. So the net additional gross revenue from that equated to about $256 million. And when you net that out, uh, it more than pays for the entire electronic medical record in that number alone. Um, we were able to do, and this was, this was different, we were able to take some of the best practices that Epic had and we were able to enhance those around our security. And we actually did a, an additional round of both revenue cycle and clinical security checks through everything. And what we understood was the range could be anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of your calls could be security related. Um, we were able to basically to manage that number to about 4% of all of our tickets were some were security issues. So what, what does that mean? Well, we were able to really minimize the impact specifically on the revenue cycle related to those first few days of people not being able to get, get in, not understanding what they needed to be able to do, and that really helped us get to a, a faster uh, revenue cycle uh, days. And then I would also say these key workshops that we had that were led by our presidents at each of the campuses really drove the accountability when a department was not hitting their baseline, there was a deep discussion on why are they not hitting, is it technical, operational, knowledge, whatever, and we were able to really get into that. And that's where we really designed this revenue integrity department that was overall accountable for making sure that each entity understood what the issues were, what was being managed, what wasn't. And this revenue integrity department is continuing and ongoing today across the network engaged with operations to uh, continue to manage the revenue. So as you can see, 20, 25 weeks through GoLive, 
Uh, we were roughly a little over 105. We uh, peaked out about 36 weeks, I think, at 109 is where we were at, and then we basically stopped measuring it because we got kind of got to the point of where we were doing well. So um, our, our original goal, if you kind of back up to uh, the first few weeks here, um, you can kind of see uh, our line of what we had planned on and then the gap between that. Um, so obviously we, we well outperformed what we had planned to. Um, so one of the big things was identifying our risks, and we knew that there was there was a number of risks. And what we ended up doing was creating this uh, risk register, and we assigned each risk to an operations or a project person, and we did, um, you know, monthly report outs at first, but then we got them down to weekly and then got them down to daily as our project progressed. And, and our, our, our COO, along with operations, would basically go through all these risks, talk about them, talk about what the mis mitigation plan was and how we're going to deal with it. And so a couple of them were our um, multiple systems uh, converting, uh, accountability, um, and really some of the reporting packages were kind of different because uh, we have multiple systems on multiple hospitals. Uh, and then we, we had a lot of third-party systems that had interfaces uh, that were going to be coming over were high dollar areas. So we had to do a significant amount of more testing in these areas to ensure that things were going to come over properly. Um, you know, you can't emphasize enough on change management that really this is an operations project and that there has to be executive engagement. And we set up our governance structures where they were operationally owned and project team supported. So all decisions were were really built up from the project team, but made and executed at the at the executive uh, level all the way throughout. So we had steering committees in different areas, and we spent a tremendous amount of energy making sure they were not IT decisions. And that, that takes a lot more time uh, in your project, so I definitely would say plan for extra time to really have a, a, a clean um, you know, decision-making process, tool to make decisions, and, and, a, and a framework around that. We also had a communication plan and a communication team. We incorporated that into our operational engagement plan, and operations was, was owned the communication plan and was responsible for delivering the communication plan. Um, we also did a ton of stuff around structure and accountability, and we did policies, rewrote many policies. Um, we also did uh, awareness and readiness, so we had clinical champions come early, go through all the goals, go through the issues. They did all the updating, so we really had them doing every single piece. We fed them a lot of the stuff, and we co-discussed them, and then they would really make sure that they had the knowledge to speak to them and really took the ownership and uh, really the, um, the champion of, of all the components of it. So this was our, our pretty much our change management timeline. I'm not going to speak through all that. I kind of spoke to it before. Um, but you can see we had these revenue cycle workshops, security workshops, and we had planned on those. And those were, um, you know, led, managed, and run by operations. So talk a little bit about the post-go live. So, um, you know, it's, it's obviously every... A lot of folks have done these implementations or are planning on doing them or have done them in the past, and you know that it takes a lot of energy to get to live, and then when you go post-go live, then that's where the really hard work begins um, because now the system's live and there's a, there's a ton of challenges with prioritization. And um, one of the big things we had was we actually had strong leadership into identifying all the issues and really escalating those issues and, and a plan for that. And so we had the daily revenue capture with clinical engagement, mandatory. Everyone had to go, every manager. We didn't allow people to take off at all uh, throughout the entire network, unless there was obviously a reason. But we had 100% engagement at all the campuses. Uh, like I said, the presidents really managed that. We visited and we did reconciliation with different areas. We would take teams out, combination of operations and IT folks that were certified in different modules and really work with them on the revenue. What were the issues? What were the training things? Were there certain pieces of documentation or workflow that were causing issues in the charge capture process? So really an all-hands-on-deck approach and kind of a SWAT team uh, in certain areas, and in particular the high-dollar areas like OR, um, you know, in some of your outpatient areas where there's high, high revenue in your ancillary areas, uh, there was a tremendous amount of energy placed into those areas. 
Um, really wouldn't have been able to do it without a great tool. Um, the, the COO and the CFO need to have an accountability tool. They need to be able to look at the revenue every day. They need to be able to correlate past revenue to future revenue pre and post live. Um, so you have to have, you know, kind of dashboard drill down by location, by manager, uh, so you know exactly who and where the accountability is. Um, and, and we had those tools and they, they become very valuable um, post live. Um, so as I mentioned in the past, we have Revenue Cycle Task Force going. Um, we continued even past uh, Go Live with the operational and clinical, clinical engagement and communication. Um, well, you know, several months after Go Live, uh, we were continuing these processes and, and the Revenue Cycle and the Task Force continue ongoingly today. Um, we continued with the system workflow around training and retraining. Um, really our, our reconciliation tools, we did some modifications in those, uh, and then we continued retraining. So we would do, you know, the department director, we would pop on, do a remote on the PC, look at what they were doing, see what was going on, have, have direct conversations between them and the project team on what the issues were. And it really became, clinical was obviously super important, and we knew we couldn't fail in that area because patients were at risk, but we also knew that if we didn't have the money flowing, we weren't going to, uh, be able to support those clinical areas as well as we were. So there was as much emphasis on the revenue as there was on the clinical side of the project. This is just a breakdown of our revenue cycle, and as I said, it's operationally engaged. You can see the v different VPs from our entire uh, finance organization, each of our campuses down below, and then they had various uh, department managers at each of the campuses. This just kind of shows you a visual of the revenue management task force, and it was not, it was you know, led by Revenue Cycle, but really supported by the clinical operations side of things. Uh, and we also had key roles because we have a finance director, director at each site. So they were really there to help work with the different uh, department managers on the accountability. So all this structure was really what made the difference. Um, we know the system works and it works well, uh, and we heard that, but we knew this structure here was going to be the difference between, you know, success and not success. And these People uh, eventually knew what they were doing, and that took some time. Uh, you have to learn a new system, um, but they were obviously, based on the on the facts that we have, able to pick it up really quickly, take the ownership, and move it forward, and kind of get this uh, to a, a normalization uh, very soon uh, after go left. So this is just kind of a view of our reporting and. If you can kind of see, which is hard to see on the screen, so I apologize for that, um, but you can kind of see just start end dates, capture. You can see like the quantity of volume, the amount, uh, the total charges, and then you can see pre-baseline, post-baseline. You can really quickly see where the red areas are, where the departments were, who the main point of contact was on that, what cost center it was, et cetera, and where they were at. So, you know, this, this is a kind of continuation of Pre, pre to post where, where things were at associated with the, the go live and this really became kind of the Bible of, of our go live for our revenue cycle teams and um, you know this was this was the daily focus and uh, I remember like the second or third day in we really dipped down um, way below where we wanted to be and there was like a tremendous amount of energy to take us out of that for a couple of days and we were able to peek out of that and I really think that that third day when our leadership team had the data and was able to say this isn't acceptable and then got everybody on key areas where we saw that, that's really what peaked us back up. I mean, we wouldn't have had this visibility into there and the person and the people that are able to make these people get the work done, we would have never recovered as fast as we uh, did. So, you know, I think one of the big things that we talked about, and we talked about this many times throughout the project, is, is that the revenue responsibility now for the, the department managers, clinical managers, is going to be the new normal. And uh, they knew this was going to happen, and there's actually a lot of conversation of, I don't have time for this, this is more work, I don't know what to do, like, how can I do this, I have my other job. Uh, and we pretty much heard all that. We increased no additional FTEs during that process, and we were able to still manage it. And today, there's literally no complaints, there's no concern over this, and it's kind of just daily operations um, moving forward about what their roles and responsibilities. And obviously there was a big push there, uh, but once they get in there and they understand like what causes these things, 
they're actually in much better position to resolve these things than anyone else because they know what's coming out of their department related to charges and how things work now. So uh, it's actually better than what it was in the past because we had folks in revenue cycle that may not be as uh, inept to a specific department's uh, charging issues. Um, the real big component um, related to um, post go live is we put this revenue guardian configuration in which allowed us to do some additional increases in revenue and charge capture after go live we defined some additional work rules uh, and then we configured some of these these guardian best practices for the reports uh, and kind of have created this kind of continued iterative process around charge capturing for uh, continual improvement and that's that's paid off in the in the many millions of dollars uh, as well even post go live as additional uh, revenue uh, opportunities that we continue to fund. So I'm not going through the entire project. The whole goal today wasn't really to go through um, every single one of the entire EPIC implementations. And, and I know I'll be early and, and short and sweet with this and leave, leave time to, to uh, talk through any lessons learned or, or discuss this with folks at the end. Um, but I really think our, our my main thing is Organizational have to shift responsibility. Anytime you do a major project, really identifying those those areas that where the responsibility and roles are going to shift, and making sure people understand that. We had these cards that basically said, "This is what you used to do in your old world, and this is what you're going to do in your new world." And we had like a one page for each person, and they said, and to really help them understand that, hey. Your title might need, not be changing, but what you do every day is definitely changing, and these are the areas that we think they are. And we had subject matter experts from those areas helping us kind of validate those things and making sure that folks really understand that it was a, a real change in many spots. Um, the charging workflow, these charge queues, it's, it's super complex to understand them. And um, there was a tremendous amount of what I would say even lack of knowledge between everyone really working on them until you dug into the details. So really, you can try to understand them before go live, but you're not going to truly understand them until you go through there because you just can't process every single charge in a testing uh, uh, process and understand. Well, I mean, you have to, but you can't really understand what, what's going to get kicked out uh, along the way. So um, nothing's better than kind of learning uh, as you go. Um, we really continue to have um, the finance organization kind of be the champions of this and then continue and that's related to the reporting, the responsibilities. Uh, I see them in the rooms and the huddles still continuing to work on the issues and they really incorporated this as a, as a truly an organizational wide uh, revenue cycle uh, function and um, you know it's paid off for us. So I think with that, you know, I'll, I'll probably end with operational engagement, and it's not an easy thing to set up, and it's not an easy thing to do. And I think the best way that I was able to really help people understand was by presenting the numbers. And I think being able to talk through what a good go live looks like from a numbers perspective and a bad go live looks like, it's fairly easy to get some of the senior management involved in that. Because um, the numbers can be pretty substantial on paper uh, when you talk about good, good, you know, you know better, best um, kind of methodology, and um, that really helped kind of, kind of move folks uh, into saying, you know, what we have to take ownership of this. Um, the basically the uh, the the COO would say, uh, there's going to be three people that aren't going to be here anymore if we don't make this work, and that's the CIO, the CFO, and the COO. So we have to figure out how to work together to make this happen, and that really was the the partnership that started, that never ended, that um, really helped drive the accountability across the organization. So I appreciate your time. I look forward to answering some questions here at the end. I'm going to hand it back over to you, Anthony. All right, Chad, very good. Thank you uh, so much for that great presentation, a lot of good information in there. And we look forward to having a chat about it. So as I mentioned, go ahead and send your question into the Q&A box and we'll get that in front of Chad. Uh, Chad, let me start by asking you, you set pretty high goals as far as how soon after Go Live you wanted to achieve 100% baseline revenue. Any suggestions on how organizations can set high but achievable goals given their resources? Um, you know, I think 
I think the goals were set out because we knew we had to. I think in reality, our um, our goal was shoot high, and if we come in half as good as where we were, we knew we were in good shape. Anything, I mean, if you look at some of the packages that, that Epic provides, and I'm sure other, other vendors can help you understand how their customers do, we knew at a certain threshold our organization wasn't, we were going to have to make a ton of other bad decisions if we weren't able to meet a certain threshold. So really, we came in better than our goal, um, and I, I literally think it's because we set a high bar, and people knew mm -hmm. the bar was high. Um, and so, you know, the difference in this of setting a high bar and not setting a high bar, um, the management team is going to have to work a lot harder on, you know, uh, FTE reduction, and we don't have any money, and all the other negative consequences that go with it. So. Um, I really, I really don't think there's an option to not be in at least uh, better than average in these categories, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. We don't have any money is not a not a thing you want to hear in a health system, right? It's going to create a lot more pain for the managers than it is if 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 they're just putting the energy in ahead of time. Right. Um, but you know what I would what I would really say is 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 everyone has the resources. It just it requires this to be the resource's primary focus, if that makes sense. How would you describe, it does, how would you describe the balance or the challenge of the technology challenge versus the human resources challenge? You mentioned getting people to take on different roles and saying, frankly, your job is changing, uh, and people don't like that. So is that the responsibility of, of the CIO and then the IT team to get people to come around to embracing their new role, or is that something another department's handling? Well, actually, it was, you know, I felt like it was IT's job to make sure that the appropriate folks that knew the jobs needed to change were on board with that, and it's their job to agree to that and then make the role changes. So I think where we played the role was helping people understand jobs are changing, and if they don't, significant impact. And we were able to do that at a top level operational executive level. And once that was done, they really said, hey guys, this is happening. We're making these changes. These are the changes that need to occur. We're going to have accountability on this, or these are our metrics. We're going to make that happen. So what I would say was us helping understand and educate, and then them under really understanding the impact of not doing that, and, and, then, and then being the champions to say, yep, all the department managers get in a room, we're going to build a workshop, you're going to come, you're going to get training, you're going to get education. I'm going to, as the COO, president of my site, I'm going to be here with you along the way, and I'm fully committed to helping you be successful through this change. So it's that whole process that I really think that made the difference. What about um, key relationship you need with, with, your, with your main vendor that you're going down the road um, in this project with? Um, so before you go down this road, I would imagine you want to make sure you have a good rapport, everyone's on the same page, you have the right level of contacts. Talk about that a little bit and what it takes on the vendor side to make this a success. Yeah, well, I think I think on I could maybe split that into three different components if you're okay with that, and I'll talk about the vendor first. So sure. I think one is the vendor obviously has to educate you on what are all the changes. I think that there is a lot of information out there um, about that. I, there, what I found out through this process was there wasn't as many people as I thought that knew what the real key ingredients were on this. I mean, there was a whole entire process put in place. Um, I, it ended up being a little bit bigger than what, from what I had originally ma imagined. So I definitely had the vendor and uh, other CIOs telling me what the issues were, but I don't think because we – um, knew what that meant in the new speak, that we actually knew what, knew what that was. So I probably would say the best information I got was when I actually did a site visit and we actually got to see it in, in, in live and brought people out and really went through that process. And so I think the visualization of how it actually works was probably the most important piece of that. And our definitely our vendor helped us get out there and do all those sessions. But I think speaking about it and talking about it is one thing, seeing it as a completely different uh, perspective. So I think a combination of those things really help. Talk a little bit more about site visits. Um, how do they get set up? You mentioned the vendor helping out. Um, and how, and what's a good way to go about them, to plan for them, to be prepared to get the most out of them? Well, I would say, you know, thank, thanks to the folks that did this for us. Um, you know, we, 
we did different clinical ones. We did, um, you know, we, we went out to, for example, Gary down at Lancaster. He hosted us many times, so thank you, Gary, for that. We went out to Norton. Uh, me and the VP of Revenue Cycle went out uh, to, to Norton Healthcare. Um, they really helped us there. So it's really the CIO network, um, you know, helping helping other CIOs and. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've cascaded down and helped others and hope I can, you know, repay the favor. So I, th I definitely think, you know, CIO to CIO contacts and, you know, all the CIOs are great. They'll follow up with you and help you in any way possible. So um, that's, that's been, been the way that it has been working for us in the past and really got some great site visits and got people over and got them involved in that. And what would you say as you went down this path, what was the thing that turned out to be harder, harder than you expected or a surprise? The one hardest thing that I thought. Um, I'd probably actually say convincing people that this was a problem. Okay, interesting. Tell me more about that. Um, I don't – I it. It took me a while to figure out how to explain how to explain this, and until I started actually putting numbers down on paper, it it did, I don't think it hit people. If that makes sense, you talk about it, right. there's going to be this big change, and you know, well, no one can really correlate what that means. Well, when you start like literally putting down many, many millions of dollars where they look on the paper, and then they like they they turn white when you tell them what it could look like. Here's you know, here's here's okay. Here's really good, and here's great. Where do you want to be? And they all say, "Well, I want to be a great." Okay, well, what are we doing about being? If you like this number, what are we going to do about getting here? Uh, right. We don't know. What should we be doing? So I think that changed the discussion. Uh, you know, the data, 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 data kind of speaks for itself, and uh, and I think that really helped change the conversation. And in terms of resources, when you're looking to go down this path. Um, you know, everybody only has a certain amount of resources. You have to prioritize. There's governance to help you decide what to do. Um, is there a way to think about how much this is going to take out of your capacity? For example, this is going to take 40% of your team for two months or anything like that to give people an idea of what it takes. Um, you mean operations or IT or both? Both. Uh, well, well, on IT, I mean, we, we – we backfilled, you know, outsourced our IT where we could, and many of the folks came over to the project, so we were 100% committed to the project um, with all the resources that we need to be. So we, you know, we had over 100 and something people fully committed to the project. And then from operations, the commitment level was this is the number one project in the network. If, if something is going on with this, this is your, your top priority, and then everything else falls second. Uh, and we got that commitment level. And I would say, you know, we were fortunate with the level of engagement that we had where there's always resource complaints, but um, our executive team really said, well, tell us how you're going to figure that out because that's your problem. We need you to do this. So, you know, we really had uh, really great operational engagement. I mean, it's, it starts with a sweet suite and, and works its way down because you need to have that support when there's that pushback. So uh, we have a great management team here. Um, they were fully committed to being successful in this. And I really think it started with um, getting them involved in the decision-making process of even doing this and why we were doing this. And that, that brought them into the strategy so they knew we needed to do this, why we needed to do it, how we were going to do it, and what the role was going to be within that well before we signed the contract. Um, so did they know all the specifics? No, but they knew, they knew this project was for them, about them, and they were engaged in that process. What about uh, in terms of the things that you know you need to have in place, the relationships, the resources, any deal breakers come to mind? So if you're a CIO and you don't have these key things set up or this one particular key thing, you're going to be in real trouble trying to get this accomplished. If people don't know what the goals are, what the value is we're going to get out of it, you know, what the benefits, I won't go through it today, but we did a whole benefits realization on our project. Um, we think we got about a four and a half year payback out of Epic um, to the bottom line. That's all hard dollar savings, no soft dollar savings. Um, so we did a lot of time on benefits, goals and objectives, guiding principles, 
you know, a lot of that. And if all of the executives and all the key ones, all the C-suite are not like shaking their head, all involved in agreement and alignment, this is not going to, people are going to swim in the other direction, right? Right. So, you know, you know, in the C-suite, you have to have a really a combined, um, you're going to get a lot of pushback from many areas, right? And and that, that doesn't need to come to the CIO or the project team every single time. And it's got to, you know, the buck's got to stop somewhere when that comes up. And we were able to have that, you know, that that discussion in those areas without the whole entire project team getting beat up. So it was really it was really a whole, all hands on deck organizational commitment uh, from the CEO down. You know, a lot of CIOs were always talking about um, having a seat at the leadership table and not just being seen as the IT guy. Uh, does managing and leading a project like this help that occur? Uh, I guess if you're successful, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> still here. Um, you know, I, I think so. I mean, I would, I would tend to let them speak for themselves about their view of IT. I think we have a good relationship across the organization. Um, you know, we listen, we get things done, we work well with folks, we push back on things. We have a, you know, a healthy. Um, back and forth, open relationship, um, and I think that helps, right? I mean, I think, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend doing this project in the first six months that you're there at your job. Yeah. Sure. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a good timing. So, you know, make sure that, that really all the relationships are where they need to be to, to help you through because you're going to need, you know, it's, it's, a, it's more about them than it is about IT. Let's just put it that way. Um, the, you know, if we didn't have any users on the system, we could we could build the platform really easily, right? Right. Um, so I think it's you know that that process, and we were. I think the what I would say is that I definitely think that there's a, a better appreciation and a better relationship, not just at my level, but my whole entire team's level at the organization. I think there's a good respect behind them and what they're able to do, and the confidence that they have, and their ability to get things done. And um, you know, I think that my team has felt good about that transition. Excellent. Well, I think um, that's where we're going to wind it up today. Chad, I want to thank you so much for sharing that great information. I think you've helped a lot of people today. Um, when you close out your window, you're going to be taken to a post-event survey. Please take a moment and answer it. I want to uh, thank very much Chad Brizendine, our featured speaker today. You'll receive an email when this recording has been posted to our YouTube channel. If you hold the CHIME CHCIO certification, attending our webinars gets you one CEU, so let CHIME know you are here. And if you've asked us to do so, we will. To produce a webinar panel discussion on the topic of your choice or a featured presentation, you can contact Nancy Wilcox. And if you need a certificate of attendance for another CEU program, you can use the final slide in this deck. And of course, you can go to our website to see our upcoming schedule. So with that, I want to again thank Chad and our audience. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Have a great day. You got it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Back.